All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, we need you. We pray, Lord, that you please would help us to love the truth more and more. Help us to desire it. And, uh, Lord, help it to be what's important to us in this life. It's what separates us from this world. It's what separate us, separates us from all error, all wickedness. Everything that's against thy word, because thy word is truth. Please help us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 14 and verse number 6, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. By, uh, <clears throat> now, the title of this is, is Christ's Mass is not about the truth. It's not. It's not about the truth. What do you say that? Well, first let's start with the name. What does that mean, Christ's Mass? You know that means death and not birth? What is a mass? It's not a birth, is it? What is it a celebration of the Eucharist? What is that? Death. So why would you say Mary, Mary Christ's death? Now the world rejoiced over his death, didn't they? Think about that. The world rejoiced over his death. He said, he said that... Um, he said that you'd have sorrow, you know, because of my death, but others would rejoice because of it. They would be excited. They'd be happy about it. Well, listen, this is confusing. It, it, it's confusion. If you just say Christ, man, at Christmas, it has nothing to do with Christ in that fashion. It has nothing to do with his birth. So where does it come from? What is that all about? You know, I'm not going to get into that and the pagan roots of it really today. We've already discussed that in times past. But what I want to, what I want to talk about is the truth is that the world does not want the truth. That is the truth. As we went out yesterday and preached the Word of God in the open air, the world proves Christmas is not about the truth. Everything around us, Brother Paul, that was going on, proved to us and proved, manifested itself, that it was not about the truth. No. Do you realize that we stood opposite of Santa Claus that was having little children sit on their lap, sit on his lap? To sit on the lap of a complete stranger is very odd to me. Is that odd to you? Amen? Brother Russ, is that odd to you? It's odd to sit on anybody's lap at our age, but I mean, just, but, but, but for a child to play, to play, <laughs> to play, <laughs> that would be rather frightening. Uh, but, uh, but, it doesn't make any sense, does it, to place your child on a complete stranger's lap you don't even know? Say, here, sit here. Look in the Bible what it meant to sit on someone's lap and what was done like the father when he did that and, and, and how he blessed them and how Joseph set his sons on his father's lap and, he, and, and how they blessed him. And, I mean, just think about some of those things and you get a correlation of, of what, really, what that's really all about. But do you know that Santa's little helper came over to me? This is a lady, and said to the pre and said and what she said to the preachers of God's word. Remember the ministers that were bringing good tidings of the one that came and gave his life a ransom. You know the supposed babe in the manger that grew up. You know the one that the one the one you keep saying Merry Christmas about this Santa's little helper. She's walking around saying Merry Christmas. This older lady, about fifty years old, sixty years old, maybe. Yeah, that one. She said, could you please wait a half an hour till we leave until you start preaching? We don't, we don't want to hear that preaching now. Could you just wait? Sure. Okay, we did. I, I was polite. So what did you do that for? So they couldn't say we came there to cause trouble. That's why. To give no offense. So I waited. I felt like it was wisdom, right, Brother Paul? Just We'll just wait. And Brother Paul said, well, let's pray then. And we did. We spent a good amount of time, in about 20 minutes in prayer. We spent the other 10 minutes handing out some gospel tracts to people that were walking by. Then she said, hey, could you not even put those signs up? Could you just leave those signs out or just leave them down until, until we're gone? I said, no, we can't do that. No. That would be the Christian thing to do, she said. That would be the Christian thing to do. I said, no, we can't do that. Brother Paul, Brother Paul said, no, the Christian thing to do is to show the Scripture. <laughs> Down boy. 
<laughs> Brother Paul's ready to go, man. He knew it. Brother Paul said to me, he sent me a text. He said, man, we're going to be in trouble today. I just have a feeling. I said, oh, great, brother. <laughs> He goes, we're going to jail. I just know it. I, I, I thought it was coming. <laughs> right, Brother Paul? Yeah. That banner? Oh, man, that banner. I mean, it, you can see that all the way down the block, both sides. I mean, it's it's like a beacon, brother. It's I mean, it's just shining out there. You can see it. It's like, uh-oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Anyway. We tried to be nice. So then Santa's little helper wasn't too happy about that. So we then prayed and handed out tracts. And as Brother Paul preached about Christ, you know, the ones these merchants are pretending to be celebrating as they rake in dollars. You know, the ones that are Merry Christmas. Oh, we, we stand for, we stand, we're not going to stop saying Merry Christmas. Oh, well, you patron saint, you. That's wonderful. Aren't you wonderful? We're not going to say Happy Holidays. We're going to say Merry Christmas. That's great. Way to contend for the faith. Brother, fundamentals actually be they're contending for the faith saying Merry Christmas. You're not contending for anything. <laughs> Except for the Mass. <laughs> Except to show some Protestant Catholic roots. But other than that, <clears throat> it has nothing to do with it. So anyway, so uh, Paul, preached, uh, Paul preached about Christ, and a merchant came out. And told me, she came out, this lady came out of her store and she was very upset. Man, she came out and she's... Make him stop! She's yelling. Make him stop! He's doing it all wrong! He's doing it all wrong! He's ruining the message! I was like, lady, he's preaching. He's yelling. Like, how do you think Jesus preached to 5,000 people? You think he whispered? I mean, she wouldn't let me say that to her. I was wanting to say, I tried to, but she just kept going. I was like, well, how come you don't get mad at a football game? But she, she just, I'm calling the place! She just, she just clocked off and ran, ran to the store. And back in the store. Well, that certainly wasn't the Christmas spirit, was it? Yes, it was. If you understand what it is, it's the spirit of Antichrist. Come on, don't be fooled, please. The world hates Christ and they cared nothing for the preaching of God's word and calling men to repentance. As I preached Christ and stepped down, there was a nice lady that she brought us some cocoa and a sandwich. Wasn't she a nice lady? She, yeah, yeah. Yeah! She went down to Hogan Brothers, and well, her children saw us preaching there, and their, her children ran and go, went and told her mom and her, their mother that we were preaching there. Well, she was in that Hogan Brothers, and she came out. She thought it was just me. She didn't know there was other, other guys preaching there, so she brought, she brought some hot cocoa and, some, and a sandwich. I did split it with Dad, though. I didn't eat it all. Right, Dad? I split that sandwich with you. I don't know what it was, but it was good. I can't, still can't figure out what that thing was. Anyway, <laughs> whatever it was. But you know what? They thanked us, and there was about ten of us, get, ten of them gathered around us. Right, brother, with the kids and everything, and adults, probably about eight, maybe seven, eight. And they were all gathered, not a, thanking us for what we were doing. Thanking us for being out there and saying, man, more people need to be out doing this. And You know, you were given the bread of life, so we want to give you some bread, she said, so. Yeah, that's what she said. So, so we we thanked her for that, and and the cop was sitting over in the corner, waiting for her to leave. Yeah, waiting for this lady to walk away with her with the group that was with her. So then, you know, he wouldn't be seen as what he was doing. Well, then the police came, and in true Christ mass fashion tried to breathe out threatenings against us that we would be in trouble, and that he had special magical powers when we were standing in the public park as opposed to the public sidewalk. You know, this, 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 this little square gave him magical powers where he had more jurisdiction over us than he did over on the sidewalk. He kindly informed me that he could trespass us off the park for a year if he wanted to. That all he had to have was a complaint, and if he got one, we had to stop. Unfortunately, the good sheriff of Nottingham, I mean the police officer of Northfield, had it quite... <laughs> had it, had it. 
sorry. That's from Robin Hood. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> hey, it's not a wonderful life. <laughs> Do you remember that, Mr. Bailey? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you remember that, don't you? <laughs> anyway, anyway, he had it wrong on, unfortunately, he had it wrong on two accounts because a simple reading of the ordinance of the city proves that he doesn't have magical powers on one public way to another. It's all the same. The second thing the good officer had wrong was that if someone complains, we have to stop. That's called a heckler's veto. And it's been, it's been thrown out of every court case and awarded to the preacher every time because you can't, you can't just come up and say, you don't have a right not to be offended. You can't just come up and say, well, you know, I want them to stop, so they have to stop. Well, why? Well, that's what he said, though. He said, well, I can, uh, if somebody calls and complains, then, 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 I, then, then we'll make you stop. And I can trespass you off of this place? I said, oh, really? What about that sidewalk over there? He said, well, that's different. He's try what he was trying to do was get me to believe, don't come back here. You're going to have problems. Well, I assure him, we will be back. We will be back. Yeah. But I say all that to say this. They could care less about Christ, none of them. Where was that police officer's Christmas spirit? You know, where was it? Good, brother. <laughs> Maybe not every day, but we'll see. I gotta have a voice left for the rest of the week, but 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 we should probably go out this week, yeah. <laughs> oh, you better be down here one day. We're gonna try to see what you can do if you're in town, man. Oh man, yeah, yeah. Oh, Brother Paul, <laughs> we're going to be in trouble. Anyway, well, praise the Lord. <clears throat> anyway, they could care less about Christ, none of them really. There were many that listened, but those who were buying gifts and others who were enforcing their own laws didn't care much for what we had to say about Christ. If that really was what the season was about, then what was the, what was the reason for the obstinance toward the preaching of God's word? What was the obstinate if they are really celebrating the birth? When Santa's helpers said it would be the Christian thing to do if we would just wait until they decided it was okay for us to preach and that we would take down our signs and everything. What does it remind you of, though? Turn to Acts chapter 4. But that it spread, verse number 17, but that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them. Hey, we heard that. That they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And so when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom the miracle of the healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them. Why are they saying that? God, this property is yours. This land is yours. This open air is yours. You made it all, God. That's right. Who by the mouth of thy servant David had said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? Why did the heathen rage? Stop! Why were they raging? Why were they mad? We weren't mad. Why was the why was the police officer mad? We weren't mad. We weren't mad. Why was the lady in the store come out stopping her ears 
and angry. Nothing's changed. But see, here's the reason why. When you're comfortable and you don't ever get out in the open air and you don't ever experience this, you think this is all dead. Like this stuff doesn't happen anymore. But I'm going to tell you something right now. If it weren't for street preachers and evangelists out there preaching this in the open air, you wouldn't have a First Amendment. Look at Leland. Look at John Leland and, Madison, and the Mad Leland Madison Memorial. Look at those men. Then look at these street preachers that are going to jail every day and having to battle it in court and having to sue these people and have to have federal injunctions against them or federal cases against them because their civil rights have been violated. But see, you don't hear about none of that because nobody gets mad when you bust a bunch of people into the church house and you own the property and you make all the rules. And you, but when you go out and you preach in the open air, it's going to be a different story. You're going to see these things happen. See how alive this becomes to you today? See how the truth comes out to you today from just what transpired yesterday? You that were there and seen it firsthand, you watched this happen. You watched it. That they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. <laughs> and all that is in them. Yeah, even the police. Watch this, though. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? Listen, the kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. What happened yesterday? That's what happened. By the way, you think it's new? I can show you quote after quote after quote after quote from Charles Spurgeon and other men. Charles Spurgeon talked about a man that preached on the, cor the street corner by where he was for 47 years. He said he battled the police, said that. He battled the Unitarians and all the false religions on that street corner preaching the Word of God. And they all came for 47 years. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And God was with him all the way. Oh, I suppose Charles Spurgeon said somebody could say, well, you don't have the results and you don't, I mean, how many people got saved and how many this, that's not up to him to decide. That's not up to you to decide either. Amen. That's right. It's obedience. That's what matters. But you look at that. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Look, for of a truth, listen, this is, so, this is so ironic, for of a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Do you realize that that's exactly what happened yesterday? They're supposed to be selling, running around saying Merry Christmas, Santa Claus is putting little kids on his lap, talking about the Holy Child. And they wanted the preachers, they raged against them and were mad at them and wanted them to stop. Isn't it fitting the language, thy Holy Child, Jesus? Yeah. Folks, it's not about, Christmas is not about the truth. It's not. If it was, none of it's not about Jesus. Jesus is the truth. If it was about him, none of that would have taken place. It took place because it was supposed to be a Christmas holiday. That's why it happened. That's why we had the head button we had. It ought to show you that battle with the principalities, the spiritual wickedness, the, 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 the rulers of the darkness of this world, the spiritual wickedness in high places. Look, think about it. Think about it. December 21st through the end there, through the 28th, whatever, that week where, where the, it's the highest satanic, one of the highest Satan, Satan days of the year, satanic days of the year right now. And we go out and preach on a supposed... Christian holiday? Preaching the book? And preaching salvation through Christ's name? And what happens? This happens. This. This. 
Why did it happen? Over the truth. As long as they can continue with their cunningly devised fable, as long as they can continue with that, and the merchants of Diana can make money, but if you start touching their pocketbook, or you start offending them, then the, one, the merchants that are making the idols to Diana, sound familiar? They'll run you out of town. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. See, I, I wasn't real worried about that yesterday as we left there because one of the things that I understand is, is this right here, that God sees this. I, I would be spiritually concerned if I was the person that caused the trouble. I wouldn't want to be the one that stopped the mouth of the preacher. Yeah. That's right. I wouldn't want to be that. I wouldn't want to do that. Why? Because why? Because any of us? No, we're nothing. We wouldn't do anything. We don't have to. God does that. God will do that. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant of thy servant that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Boldness that they may speak thy word. <clears throat> we are not about to back down. We're getting fired up. We're just getting started. Amen? Yeah. Why? Because we're proving that this is not about Christ. None of this is about Him. If it was for them, for us, it, preaching of God's Word is about lifting up Christ. For them, it's about money. For them, it's about celebrating some fictitious baby in a manger somewhere. Not the risen Lord. Not the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, the Almighty, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, the Lamb which taketh away the sins of the world. They don't want the Lamb which taketh away. Why? Because Christmas is not about the truth. That's why it's not. Next, there's no truth in celebrating the birth on December 25th. Nothing in Scripture, by the way, tells us to remember Christ's birth. Can you find one command of God that states that we should worship the birth of Christ or that it should be a part of our worship? I can find Bible verses that command us to remember his death, not his birth. Why is it that the world would want to commemorate his birth but speak very little about his death? Why? Because it was a bloody and terrible death, the death of the cross. Everyone loves babies. I mean, who would be offended at the babe in the manger? Not a person would be offended at the babe. But many at the Christ who preached everywhere that men should repent. Can you tell me why people hated the preaching of, of, of the one that they were supposed to be celebrating? By the way, when tracing the priesthood of John the Baptist's father and other things, we can surmise that he was born sometime in September. I'm going to read you some things. The key to knowing when Jesus was born, this is from Brother Eck has put this together. The key to knowing when Jesus was born centers on Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. The, the, the account of Zacharias and his priestly service is found in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 1, verse 5, we learn that Zacharias was there at the course of Abiah. This is a description of the family of Zechariah is descended from. King David appointed the courses that turns the turns or order of the ministration to ensure that the priestly work was evenly divided so as not to burden one family or another over another. In 1 Chronicles 24, 1, now these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron. The sons of Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. But Nadab and Abihu died before their father and had no children. Therefore, Eleazar and Ithamar executed the priest's office, and David distributed them, both Zadok, 
of the sons of Eleazar and Ahimelech of the sons of Ithamar according to their offices and their service. And there were more chief men found of the sons of Eleazar than of the sons of Ithamar. And thus were they divided. Among the sons of Eleazar there were sixteen chief men of the house of their fathers and eight among the, the sons of Ithamar according to the house of their fathers. Thus were they divided by lot, one sort with another, for the governors of the sanctuary, the governors of the house of God, were of the sons of Eleazar. Eleazar, and of the sons of Ithamar, and of Shemaiah, the sons of Nathaniel, the scribe, one of the Levites, Levites wrote them before the king, and the princes of Zadok, the priests of Ahimelech, and the son of Abiathar, and before the chief of the fathers of the priests and the Levites. They kept a good order. You understand that? One principal household being taken of Eleazar, and one taken for Ithamar. Now the first lot came to to Jehoharab, I think, whatever his name is. Anyway, the second to Jedediah, the third, the third to Haram, the fourth to Serum, the fifth to Machali, the, the sixth to Benjamin, I guess. Anyway, the seventh to Hagos, Hagos, and the eighth to Abiah, the ninth to Jeshua, the tenth to Shechaniah, the eleventh to El Eliashib, the twelfth to Jacob. This is going through order down to the priesthood. Listen, the thirteenth to Hupa, the fourteenth to Jeshabib, and the fifth, the fifteenth to Bilgah, the sixteenth to Emer, the seventeenth to Hazar, the the eighteenth to Aphsis, the nineteenth to Hethiah, the twentieth to Je. Jehezekiel, whatever his name is, the son of the son of the twentieth to Jachin, the two and the twentieth to Gamuel, and and the three and the twentieth to Deliah. I'm reading you all this list so you understand that they kept a good track of this, person to person down through. Three and twentieth to Delilah, the Deliah, excuse me, the four and twentieth to Maziah. These were the orderings of them in their service to come into the house of the Lord according to their manner under Aaron their father as the Lord God of Israel commanded him. As we have read before, the course of Abiah was the eighth course. This means that Zacharias was following in the footsteps of the son of Abiah in performing the eighth course. As you also notice, there are 24 courses. Each course consisted of one week, twice a year. The courses started in the first month. This principle is outlined in 1 Chronicles 27. So the first course would begin in the first month first week, and each week the next course would take its turn. There were also three main feasts per, per year upon which the whole congregation of Israel came to the temple in Jerusalem. These three feasts were the feasts of the Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. On these three weeks, the whole priesthood would minister. In the case of Zechariah, then, during the eighth course, it would have been the tenth week of the year because Passover and Pentecost were observed since the first of the year. The Hebrew calendar begins with the first month of Nisan, which is right around the beginning of April. The Hebrew calendar was a lunar calendar as opposed to our current solar calendar, and this explains the difference between the calendars. This also explains why Easter is never on the same date every year. It is supposed to be the first Sunday after Passover, which is when Jesus was crucified. Passover is determined by the Hebrew calendar, and thus you have a fluctuation of dates regarding Easter. There's a little bit of... Some people have two different opinions as far as that, why Easter is the way it is. Some say it's from Rome. Others say it's from the, the priesthood here. Uh, anyway, uh, anyway, Zachariah is performing the course of Abiah in the 10th week of the Hebrew year, 10 weeks after early April. In Luke, we learn that Zechariah was told that his wife, Elizabeth, would conceive John the Baptist. So after John goes home from his priestly duties, it is, it is late June when Elizabeth conceives. Next, we learn that the angel Gabriel visits a virgin girl named Mary. He tells her that she would conceive Jesus. Mary was the cousin of Elizabeth, so Mary runs to Elizabeth's house to share the good news. When Mary is given the news of her conception by Gabriel, we learn that Elizabeth is six months pregnant with child. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her. It was called barren. Since Elizabeth conceived in late June, six months later, gets us to late December. See, late December is not irrelevant because this is when Jesus was conceived, but it is not when he was born. Nine months later, Jesus would be born. This is late September, right around the Feast of Tabernacles. He has a disclaimer in here. He says, I believe Jesus was born on the Feast of the Tabernacles because Jesus fulfilled so much Scripture in his life, died on Passover, went to hell on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and rose on the Feast of First Fruits. Amen. Therefore, it makes no sense to me that Jesus will be born at just any meaningless time on the calendar. Is this because Jesus is God tabernacling in the flesh, maybe? Nonetheless, Jesus was born in late September. This is corroborated by the fact that the shepherds were close by, by the fact that Caesar Augustus decided to tax the population at the time, and this is why Joseph and Mary were traveling in Bethlehem in the first place. Does the king tax people in the wintertime when this is the time when they have less to give than any other time of the year? Right. 
Does the king require his people to travel in the winter, especially across mountains? That just makes no sense. The best time to tax would be right after the harvest. That would be when? September. There's also the idea that every preacher would agree that Jesus' earthly ministry spanned three and a half years. We also know that it was right around the time of Jesus' birth that John the Baptist baptized Jesus to mark the beginning of his ministry. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and the voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about thirty years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. <clears throat> We know he died at Passover early April, so Jesus' 30th birthday would have been three and a half years before he died. When would this be? You guessed it, September. December is not even an option. So without having been exhaustive regarding this, we have basically laid out proof that Jesus was not born in December, let alone on the 25th. If for some reason one wanted to guess that Zechariah may have been performing the course of a Abaya on the second cycle of the year rather than the first, you would have a March birth date and not December. So we can conclusively say that Jesus was not born on December 25th. That is a lie. It is not the truth. We do know when Jesus was born, so how is it that we can line up with a lie again? Aren't we supposed to line up and set ourselves apart from the world by lining up with the truth? By the way, he did that with all the King James Bible. You notice he didn't use any outside references. Do you understand that? This book has all the answers. He used the King James Bible. He didn't use a bunch of lunar calendars. He used the King James Bible. That's what he used. Amen. God has the answer there, doesn't he? It seems that this is not important for most Christians, but, that it's not, but that's not the question, is it? The question is whether or not the truth is important to God and whether we can be pleasing God by perpetuating a lie. It doesn't matter if we like it or not. It matters if it's the truth. Is God pleased if we don't follow the truth? We do grieve him with that. Let me ask you a question. Can you deny in your heart that following a lie is grieving God? If you can deny that, if you can deny that following a lie grieves God, you can say, no, it doesn't. It's fine. God's okay with it. That's okay because I mean well. It's not okay just because we mean well. It's not. Never okay to follow a lie. I've I've seen people. I've seen people tell their children to lie. I've seen fathers tell their children to lie to their mothers when they get separated and everything. Oh, don't tell your mom this. Just tell her this. Watch them do that. And then their child turns out to be a liar, and they wonder why. No lie is of the truth. You think about it. Do I want to follow do I want to follow something that's a lie along with the world when I could follow the truth? If I really wanted to celebrate it, which we're not commanded to or told to, but if I really want to celebrate it, why wouldn't I do it in September then? Why would I do it in December with the world? Why would I do it with the world? Is there something that doesn't ring off into your head that the whole world is okay with this? In general, right. That the whole world is pretty much okay. Doesn't that, doesn't that strike you as odd? Well, well, let me ask you. What what else from this book is the whole world okay with ever? Of course, yeah, they all wanted to crucify him. They were, we will not have this man to rule over us. So why do I celebrate with the world? How can I? How can I celebrate with the world when we have nothing in common? When I am crucified to the world and the world to me. I mean, is it the height of hypocrisy for somebody to say Merry Christmas, to put Merry Christmas on their window of their of their of their building and then call the police on somebody for preaching the Christ of the Bible? Really? Come on, I couldn't prove this point any better. Without a perfect illustration of it right there.
I'm not going to belabor this point here, but the truth is that mass Christmas trees have nothing to do with Christ. I've asked people, could you please explain to me what that thing has to do with Jesus Christ? Just try to think of something for me, will you? Now, that has something to do with Christ. The only tree I can think of is an old rugged cross. That's the only tree that means something. Cursed is he that hangeth from a tree. That's the only tree that I can associate with Christ. The cross. Amen? The Bible says there is hope in a tree. How about that? Not that tree. That doesn't represent Christ. Uh, there's a preacher that gets online. He talks about this stuff sometimes. and he, he was saying, well, turn to Jeremiah chapter 10. You've seen these verses before. And I'm not going to stick on this very long, but Jeremiah chapter 10, we're going to move on. But um, he said, well, this, this doesn't say Christmas tree. I agree. It doesn't. Duh. It wasn't out then. This is before that was used for that. However, Look at the words closely. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. There's a way of the heathen, and then there's the way of Christ. There's the way of the heathen, and Christ is the way. All right? There's a way that seemeth right in, 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 uh, to a man in his own eyes. Those ways are death, the Bible says. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain, for one cut of the tree out of the forest. The work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold, and they fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as a palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Now, um, let me ask you a question. That doesn't say Christmas tree, so I'll concede that point. But can you get any closer? Look at the design of it. Can you get any closer to that? I'm s <laughs> Think about it. Can you get any closer to that? I've watched somebody. I had their pictures. A friend of mine, he had some pictures on there. And he, he took his kids and he took an axe and he chopped a tree. And he, and he has pictures of this. And then he's dragging the tree out of the forest. <laughs> then he sets it up in his house and he's decking it. And I'm like... That's like that scripture. I mean, that's a perfect... I mean, I could do that if I didn't like the guy. I, <laughs> every step of the way was that. You could put that scripture there. That's exactly what it was. It's the same exact thing. Do I think people that do that are devil worshipers? No. Of course not. Do I think they're heathens? No, I don't. Do I think they're following the way of the heathen? Yes, I do. Do I think they're evil and they're going to die and go to hell? No, I don't. So let's get this straight before all the, all the rest of the hate mail comes in and everything. It says that, I, that, that if people do that, I think they're devils and they're going to... No, I don't think that, and I've never said that either. I've never once said that about that subject, ever. What I've said is if you're doing that, it's the way of the heathen. So, that's what it says. In fact, I didn't say it. I'm just reading what he said. So, ask yourself, and by the way, this is when Israel was in the height of their rebellion. And if you keep reading, you'll learn about Tammuz and the, the little drunk virgins, well, weeping for Tammuz, the harlots weeping for Tammuz. It's a whole other story. But they were. This is the way of the heathen. Plain and simple. Can you deny that that's what that is? No, I didn't say you're a heathen. I didn't say you're going to hell. I didn't say you weren't a Christian. I didn't say you don't love God. You're just wrong. Did you know that you can be just wrong and still be saved? Do you know that? You're not my enemy just because you're wrong or I'm wrong about something. doesn't mean we're enemies. You realize that, don't you? I don't think some people realize that. We're not enemies because we may be wrong about something. I don't hate you because you, you might be wrong about something. Matter of fact, I can guarantee you one thing. I'll have more grace for you than you will for me. Because I usually do. 
I usually do. A lot more. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to back off and stop preaching what I preach. But I'll guarantee you one thing. I won't hate you if you're wrong. Don't hate me for being right. The truth is the world will not celebrate Christ. Turn to John chapter 15 and we're almost done here. Christmas is not about the truth. It's not. John 15, verse number 18, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Brother Paul, we can't be surprised when you and Brother Russ and I and the rest of the men, we go out and preach that the world hates that. We're not, we're not surprised. In fact, I was just waiting for this to come. I've been waiting for it. I'm like, when's this coming? Because I know it's on its way. <laughs> it's coming. That's right. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had now listen to this, here's here's the one that makes them, here's the one that proves it all. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had, had not they they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. No cloak. Yeah. Yeah. No cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. No reason. Yesterday, we gave no offense that the ministry be not blamed. We didn't give any offense. We were kind. We were polite. We even let them have the way of the heathen, and we didn't step in when they were doing their Satan clause. That's what it is. Satan. It's not G yeah, it is Antichrist. It's exactly what it is. It's not Christ, is it? Folks, you have to understand the world doesn't want the truth. Christ, Christmas is not about the truth. If it was, then they would follow the truth, and they would not hate this book. And they would not hate the people that preach this book, but they would love it. But the world loves its own, and it doesn't love Christ. Understand that. Father, thank you. Thank you for the truth. Thank you that we know it and we can follow it. Help us to obey it, Lord. Even in these end times we live in, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.